What is it like to come face to face with evil? To confront your worst nightmare? When a killer comes calling, there's often no escape. A man who can kill is evil beyond belief. To truly encounter evil is a rarity most will never experience. I believe in evil, uh, and I have experienced people that are evil. But for those unfortunate few who do and survive to tell the tale, the mental scars often never heal. I couldn't breathe. I was, my eyes felt bulging. All I could see was his face on my face, and he was just staring into my eyes. We meet the men and women whose lives have been forever altered by their brush with the beasts who live among us. This is Encounters with Evil. Our culture plays a huge part in what we eat. Horse meat is common in France. Islam and Judaism don't eat pork. For Hindus, cows are sacred, so beef is strictly forbidden. But of all the food taboos, there is one meat that creates a gut-wrenching reaction. Human flesh. Tonight, we explore the world of cannibal killers. Coming up. We look at the German killer who found his perfect partner on the internet. The one says, I need someone who wants to be killed. And the other says, here I am. I want to be killed by you. We explore the murky world of UK cannibal killer Stephen Griffiths, who murdered and ate sex workers in his own slaughterhouse. He skinned them, dismembered them, consumed some of them. But first, one of the most depraved serial killers in American history. All kinds of sexual contact with the dead bodies. Oral, anal, into the viscera. America's cannibal killer, Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer was born in 1960 in Milwaukee, a small town 100 miles north of Chicago. He took an interest in dead animals, roadkill, and particularly the anatomical composition of small creatures. His father taught Dharma how to actually cut up animals and, and bleach their bones. He liked to take his hands, rub them around inside the animal's internal organs. It was almost like wanting to get to grips with the internal being itself, almost like he was searching for something deep within. Dharma realized he was gay around the age of 14, but kept it a secret from his parents. So we have a young man who's clearly homosexual in an unhappy environment where he can't talk to his parents because he doesn't feel emotionally close to them. I was interested in finding the Chippendale type, swimmer's build. It seems to start this catalog of fantasies, the unfulfilled fantasies that get more extreme. When I was 15 or 16, those fantasies started entering my head. Lots of a good-looking, well-built guy having total control over him. His mother and father's marriage had deteriorated and his father had moved out to a nearby motel. He was able to drink all day long. He was talking about masturbating anything between four and six times during the course of a day. Dharma found comfort in alcohol but it only fueled his fantasies. Desire grew and grew more constant and stronger. On June the 18th, 1978, Dharma picked up a young hitchhiker. It proved to be the beginning of Dharma's deranged descent into depravity. 
he actually plucked up the courage to approach his first victim, which was Stephen Hicks, an 18-year-old hitchhiker who he saw by the side of the road on his way to get to a, a rock concert, and Dharma offered him a lift. He took Stephen Hicks back to the family home. They watched videos, they got drunk, they drank some beer and some spirits. Dharma wanted sex. Hicks didn't. When Hicks decided he wanted to leave, um, Dharma decided that he wanted to keep him, one way or another. He panicked, he didn't want Hicks to leave him, and he hit him on the back of the head with a barbell. The initial blow is aimed at taking him out as, as quickly as possible. He then strangled him with that same dumbbell. He laid Hicks out in the living room and he masturbated over his body before disposing of it. He was able to break up the bones of Hicks's body, remove his skull and scatter the bones in the forest area to the back of the family home. For Dharma, the disposing of the body was as much a sexual experience as the sex he had with the bodies themselves. This, if you like, provided the template for uh, his later development of killing and eventually eating. Forced into the army by his father, Dharma's drinking spiralled out of control. I was discharged early from the service for uh, drinking too much. I didn't want to didn't want to go home because I didn't feel comfortable explaining to my folks why I was out six months early. Age 22, he was living with his grandmother and regularly frequenting bathhouses in Chicago and Milwaukee. The bathhouse culture in America is where you have swimming, steam and sauna facilities and they are mostly, but not exclusively, frequented by men who are looking for casual sex with other men. Dharma had tried anal sex a couple of times and he didn't like it. He found it very painful. He wanted a different kind of sexual experience, one where he was totally in control. He would give alcohol to the men he was attracted to, and when they were woozy or when they passed out, he would lay with them, masturbate over them, stroke them and caress them. In 1988, he was arrested for drugging and sexually assaulting a 13-year-old boy. Dharma's really eloquent. He's really bright. So when he's charged and, you know, deals with the court scenario, he comes across very, very well. He learned that when he speaks to police officers, if he's compliant and if he speaks nicely, he can get away with murder. He was put on probation and placed on the sex offenders list. Whilst living at his grandmother's and ostensibly leading a fairly clean life, um, Jeffrey Dahmer uh, picked up uh, Stephen Tuomi. And in this particular instance, he kind of sleepwalked into murder. He had rented a motel room and invited Tuomi back for sex. Dharma woke up in the morning um, with wounds and realized that he had actually murdered this person. For the wounds that the victim had on his chest and abdomen, Dharma must have beaten him both persistently and frantically, but yet he recalls no memory of what happened. He then dissects the body, cuts the, the torso and the head from the torso, just slit from the sternum to the pubic area, removed the internal organs and then cut up the flesh, calves, legs, and then moved up the head and put that in the freezer. It's almost too disgusting for, for, for people to consider, but a severed head giving him sexual pleasure would be the ultimate turn on for Dharma. I'd strip the remaining flesh off turn up the boil and did the same with the heads until I had a clean skeleton. He didn't panic, he left the hotel and he took a cab to his grandmother's house where he disposed of Tuomi's body in the basement. But his grandmother had had enough of Dharma's strange nocturnal behavior and the stench coming from his room. She kicked him out. She didn't like the smell that, that was appearing, and she also didn't like it that Dharma was bringing young boys home, not that she was aware of what he was actually doing. Within one week of moving into apartment 213 North 25th Street, it had become his personal slaughterhouse. He would offer them a drink, and he'd usually lace it with anything between five, six, or seven 
over-the-counter sedatives. And within 30 minutes, they would usually be rendered unconscious. I would usually use seven sleeping pills. All I wanted was to make it quick and painless for them. It's not enough to have somebody that's semi-conscious and raping them, um, only raping them, orally raping them. He then has to go to the next level. Other times, I'd make a slit right here in the front, a small slit. I know it sounds horrible, and I don't do it that way. He also did make incisions into the abdomen and have visceral contact in a sexual manner with his victims. He could still sense warmth. He could sense life from the individual because the internal organs had maintained their core body temperature. As the victims mount, Dharma's taste for killing increases. For a long time, it was just once every two months. Near the end, it was once a week. He would sometimes sever the head of the victim and he would talk to the victim's head whilst he flayed and eviscerated and dismembered the rest of the body. Dharma's sexual experimentation with his live victims became even more grotesque. I wanted to see if it was possible to make, it sounds really gross, zombies, people who would not have a will of their own, but would follow my instruction without resistance. The reason that Dharma decides to start drilling into his victims' heads is because he's ideally wanting to keep them alive. He doesn't want them to leave, he doesn't want them to have the capacity to argue, he doesn't want them to have the capacity to fight. So part of it is his interest in the human body, and part of it is disabling his victim, but keeping them alive. That means he owns them completely. On May the 26th, 1991, Dharma picked up 15-year-old Conorac Sinsomophone and brought him back to apartment 213. He drugged him, performed oral sex on him, and abused his unconscious body. Dharma had run out of sedatives and he'd run out of beer, so he went to a local bar, had some drinks, and was picking up some more alcohol, and he was walking back to his apartment from the bar when he saw Conorac sitting in the gutter with three women who were frantically and hysterically shouting. Milwaukee Emergency Operator 71. Okay, hi, um, this, um, I'm on 25th and State, and this is young man, he is butt naked, he has been beaten up, he is very bruised up, he can't stand, he's study fall out, he has, he is butt naked, he has no clothes on, he was really hurt. Two officers duly arrived on the scene, one dealt with the boy and the women, and the other officer spoke to Dharma. Dharma managed to casually, and very calmly, um, persuade the officers that this was just a lover's tiff, it was a domestic. And once you've had that word domestic into the mind of police officers, they tend to back off. If the police had run a background check on him there and then, they would have seen that he was a convicted sexual offender. A body was lying in the bedroom and all they had to do is look in the bedroom and that would have been it. Back in the apartment, Dharma then drills into the boy's skull and pours acid into his brain. You can't even begin to imagine the horror of that young person disorientated, in pain, bleeding, naked, being returned to the individual that shortly is also going to murder him. That young man was underage. He was a child. And the police returned a child to a serial killer to be mutilated. By now, Dharma has broken that final taboo. With his eighth murder victim, at this point, he decided that he was going to preserve some parts of the body and he was going to eat them. The heart, liver, and biceps, and possibly thigh of individuals. The fact that he's eating the bicep, which is a part of the body that he particularly was attracted to in men, um, that is giving him that, that pleasure, that he's eating that lean, masculine part of the body. Just like you prepare a regular piece of meat, they'd be cut into sizes that were small enough to eat. You've had filet mignon, haven't you? Very tender. By the summer of 1991, he was cannibalizing someone once a week. Tracy Edwards was going to be the 18th person that Dharma would have murdered, but thankfully he was able to get away and raise the alarm. He escaped, and the police this time 
went back to the apartment and did a proper search. They found the big plastic vat of sludge, which was the victim's bodies that had been put into acid. They found heads in the freezer. A thorough search of the apartment revealed seven skulls, severed hands, penises and corpses in acid-filled vats. Dharma walked into court in Milwaukee this afternoon, flanked by police and prison officers. He's charged with crimes that have both shocked and captivated Americans. Dharma initially pleaded not guilty to all charges. The subject states he used a plastic trash container or garbage bag and put the bones in it with hydrochloric acid and let them sit for about three days until they turned to a mushy substance. His belief that eating victims would keep them with him and give him their powers, their essence, was clearly insane. The issue about being sane versus insane is whether somebody is aware of their actions and has been aware of their actions throughout and doesn't suffer from any level of psychosis, for example. The defendant, Jeffrey Dahmer, is prepared to change his plea today and enter a plea of guilty to each and every count of the information. A dramatic new twist, a plea of guilty if the court would accept that he was insane. He knew what he was doing. He knew the difference between right and wrong. He knew when he was kidnapping and torturing and raping and killing those people. The question is, when these incidences were happening, whether or not he was suffering from a mental disease or defect. Did the defendant, Jeffrey L. Dahmer, have a mental disease? Answer, no. But in a legal sense, he was declared sane. That way, he could be tried as a compus mentis individual and given maximum punishment. I know how much harm I have caused. I tried to do the best I could after the arrest to make amends, but no matter what I did, I could not undo the terrible harm I have caused. I feel so bad for what I did to those poor families, and I understand their rightful hate. My name is Rita Isbell, and I'm the oldest sister of Errol Lindsay. Jim, whatever your name is, Satan. I'm mad. This is how you act when you are out of control. I don't want to ever see my mother have to go through this again. Never, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, I hate you! On February the 15th, 1992, the jury found him guilty and sane on all counts. He was sentenced to 15 consecutive life terms in prison, over 950 years. This defendant never again has the opportunity to walk the streets of our community as a free man. In prison, Dharma became a born-again Christian. One of the great things about Christianity is it will forgive you. So it can also give you reason and purpose. Even when no human being will forgive you, God will. That's why I hate you, my I hate you! This is out of control! Don't bother me, I'm not killing you, God damn it! Don't kill me, motherfucker! Can we believe that he was genuinely remorseful for everything he did if he'd got out? Would he, as a born-again Christian, would he not offend again? I doubt it. I would welcome the death penalty. I don't want to go on running away in this place. I'd be more than happy to get it over like that. He got his wish. On the morning of November the 8th, 1994, Jeffrey Dahmer was bludgeoned to death by a fellow inmate in the bathrooms of his prison. His end was sudden, grisly, and barbaric. Jeffrey Dahmer may just be a modern-day example of an innate human instinct, one that civilization has buried during man's evolution. In England's Cheddar Gorge, archaeological finds suggest that cannibalism was once practiced by our ancestors. The bones seem to be in a chaotic jumble. They're mixed in with animal bones, which show butchery marks, and it looks like these human bones were being treated just like the animal bones as food debris. The concept of cannibalism, of eating other humans being something horrific, which it is to us now, wasn't so much a problem back then. If you said to somebody 10 years ago, um, you know, here's your placenta to eat, they would probably recoil in horror. Whereas now, it's almost become a trendy thing to do. Eating a placenta 
feels something abhorrent because we make everything so medical. It doesn't mean it hasn't got a place. It is still human tissue, and to eat that technically is an act of cannibalism. For some tribes in New Guinea, eating the remains of their dead is a traditional practice. By eating that person, you'd be continuing their life in some form inside you, so it was an honourable thing to do in terms of the respect of the dead. While some societies have a cultural history of cannibalism, Western serial killers have no such excuse. And here in the UK, one British serial killer claimed to have broken this most heinous of taboos to create an image of notoriety. Stephen Griffiths, the crossbow cannibal killer. Can you confirm your name to the court, he was asked. Barely audible, the psychology graduate believed to have been studying criminology replied, the crossbow cannibal. He did say to the police that the eating of the flesh was part of the magic of it. Between 2009 and 2010, Griffiths murdered three sex workers in Bradford. Born in West Yorkshire on Christmas Eve 1969, Stephen Griffiths was the eldest of three children in a dysfunctional family setup. By the time he's in his late teens and early 20s, he has this idea that he is different from most humans and that he's got a darkness inside, and he predicts that at some point in his 30s, he will kill. He never really found his true vocation in life. He seemed to have spent a lot of his time drifting along. Growing up in Bradford, Griffiths was also exposed to reports of one of the country's worst serial killers. As a teenager, he will have been surrounded by the news of the Yorkshire Ripper. Somewhere near here lives the killer they call the Yorkshire Ripper. His five-year career of killing began in the red light district of Chapeltown. Now, five years later, the death toll has reached 13, each death bringing grief and tragedy to the victim's family. So we've got an individual here who, by their teens, has been made acutely aware of the romantic influence, the power and notoriety that killing women can get you. At 17, Griffiths was sentenced to three years in jail for stabbing a supermarket manager who tried to stop him shoplifting. He was sent to Rampton for an assessment and he spent two months there. He was diagnosed by a psychiatrist with schizoid personality disorder and psychopathy. He was telling people that he fantasised about potentially becoming a serial killer. Well, I'm misanthropic. I don't have much time for the human race. But it was one half of the human race that Griffiths really hated. Griffiths had a great distaste for women. He thought that they were lesser than him. He felt betrayed by them, potentially, because the way his mother had treated him made him feel that he was unloved. One woman unsurprised by his actions is a former girlfriend who's still haunted by the violence and chilling messages and laughter he left on her phone. I'm trying to help you. I'm not going to go away, so I guess you'd better. Former girlfriend Kathy Hancock encountered Griffith's violence and evil attitude on a regular basis. Oh, he broke my nose, he stabbed me numerous occasions. Uh, oh, God, whatever. He stabbed you? Oh, in my legs, what marks on my legs. Um, cut me with a piece of glass, all sorts. Griffiths became a university student, devoting his time to the study of serial killers plotting his own perverted path to butchery. He had studied psychology, was studying homicidal killers as a PhD. I think he was absolutely obsessed with the whole world of serial killing, and cannibalism is a particular genre of it. It's rare. So he's basically going through the amateur serial killer's book, ticking all the things he thinks you need to do to make you a notorious serial killer. He wanted to be known as somebody who stood out. His obsession and academic study of serial killers also managed to scare off one long-term girlfriend who visited his flat. She hadn't been to his place. When she finally does go there, she finds it's all encased in plastic. She was at first 
more disturbed by his collection of samurai and Japanese military swords. It saves a lot of cleaning up if you can just remove the plastic. One of his crossbows was, was mounted on the wall as well. She, in her right mind, panicked uh, and, and disappeared straight away, and rightly so. After his relationship broke down, he started using more amphetamine, he started using more speed, and he started using internet pornography more and more. It was impossible for him to get a meaningful relationship with another girlfriend when he was consuming all the speed and the pornography he could. So the only sexual outlet he really had other than masturbation was with the working girls in the local red light district. June the 22nd, 2009. His fantasy finally becomes reality. Working girl Susan Rushworth, walking alone through Bradford's red light district, is picked up, then attacked, and slaughtered by Griffiths. Griffiths chose the easiest type of victim. He chose women who had no choice but to go home with him. Prostitutes will always be the easy choice on that level. If you want to be a serial killer, then you pick people like rent boys, working girls, kids that are running away from home, or people that are trying to avoid detection by the authorities. Susan Rushworth disappears without a trace, as does his next victim, Shelley Armitage, a 31-year-old prostitute and mother of two. It's only when Griffith's third victim, Suzanne Blamire's remains are found in the river air, that police are led straight to his door. The alarm sounds. It means something's been found. And at the left of the screen, the handle of a suitcase pops up out of the water. The suitcase containing the tools was discovered just over there, some 200 yards from where Suzanne Blamire's remains were found. His crimes came to light when a caretaker reviewing the weekend's CCTV saw Griffiths chasing a woman down a corridor. And seconds later, Griffiths had killed her on camera by firing a crossbow bolt into her chest. What that camera captures is absolutely horrific. One human butchering another individual. He knows full well he's being captured on camera. That probably explains the reason why he gave the finger to the camera, but he was really giving that to the police, to society, to anybody who would study his crime later on. Griffith's knowledge of forensics, gained as a criminology student, made him believe he could cover his tracks well enough to leave no clues for the police. When the police forensic teams entered Stephen Griffiths' flat, we learned today that they would find blood samples from all three women, blood which had been projected onto the walls, over furniture and onto the carpet. How, how do you know that the fire destroys DNA? Well, certainly I think the principle I operated on was, well, it certainly isn't going to enhance the quality of the evidence. He'd clearly tried to dismember, dissect and clean up each of his three victims in the bathroom. And he was very keen on breaking up the body piece by piece. In one of the cases, she was cut up into 87 pieces. Yeah. We further arrested the suspicion of murder of Susan Blumine between 3rd and 21st and today. Once in custody, Griffiths confesses. Are you saying that you've killed Susan Rushworth? Yes. And what was the other name? Shelley Armitage. Are you saying that you've murdered Shelley Armitage? Yes. And then the last one? Susan Blamer. Right. You say you've murdered her? Yes. And it's in these interviews police discover the full horror of his crimes. He skinned them, dismembered them, consumed some of them. One psychiatrist said Griffiths's claims of cannibalism represented the ultimate attempt to exert control and power over his victims. He tells the police officers that he has ate the thighs of his victim. If you're going to eat any part of the body, the thigh probably is the best part. It's the part that's going to have a lot of meat around the bone. And when you think about women, that area of the body is quite synonymous with the female areas. He was according to people who knew him not capable sexually himself. That could have led to huge resentment and a desire to 
erase, destroy, remove the female form, even if that meant consuming it. When questioned about eating body parts, he did say to the police that, that eating of the flesh was part of the magic of it. In December 2010, Griffiths was convicted of all three murders and sentenced to life in prison. If he's driven from court, Stephen Griffiths could be in little doubt of the revulsion that community now feels towards him and the crimes he's accused of committing. We cannot begin to understand what drove this cold-hearted and manipulative individual to take three lives in such a brutal and senseless way. Why did you feel the need to, to kill her? So this interview was the last he'd ever give to the police. They tried to speak to him again, one detective told us, but he just wouldn't entertain it. Griffiths, he said, likes to control the agenda. The thing about serial killers, psychopathic serial killers, is they desire notoriety. And with the press and the internet and the accessibility and the consistent information that's out there, that means that if you do kill people in incredibly distasteful ways, then you become part of our history. With both Dharma and Griffiths, the evidence of their cannibalism is limited to their own confessions. The same cannot be said of German cannibal. I'm in my ways. He works like a slaughter. It, it looks like the, the man, the victim, is a pig. Mr. Mywes is no monster. I'm in my ways was brought up in this sprawling house in the central German village of Rutenberg. Mivers was the first child in his family. When Mivers was about eight years old, he was playing in a neighbor's garden with, with some of his friends, and he heard his father's car driving off. Mivers has claimed that he ran out onto the road and chased after his father's car. He's running after the car, crying, trying to get his dad's attention, and his dad just drives off and, he's, and he never sees him again. He'd been abandoned in the most horrific way, and he craved somebody who would never leave him. In order to cope with his isolation, the young Maiways lived in a world of his imagination. Maivers imagined that he had a brother that he would call Frankie, and he would often fantasize that he was with him and they would play together on many occasions. By creating this younger brother, he had this a, a comfort. It gave him a sense of comfort, This imaginary person who would never leave him. He wouldn't be abandoned by Frankie in the way that he was clearly abandoned out of the blue by his own father. He also had feelings about homosexual uh, sex and would fantasize about men. Mivers had began to incorporate his imaginary brother Frankie into his sexual fantasies. He's starting to have conjoined fantasies about somebody never leaving him and also fantasies about homosexual sex. Unable to confide in his domineering mother, Maiways joined the army. In his terms, it was probably an escape from the home environment. His time in the military had clearly been the making of him, and he'd learned perfectly normal, sociable skills. But after 12 years serving his country, Maiways returned back to the family home, a frustrated mummy's boy. She was bedridden, he would have to cook for her, clean, do her laundry, and I think he felt an enormous relief when she finally died. He lived in this huge house. There was 43 rooms in the house. So he was left in this situation where he had freedom to explore his urges. Cannibal Cafe was an internet forum and, and group that was primarily dedicated to the idea of, of roasting and burning individuals prior to cannibalism. I think he is a normal, it's a normal person, but he has a defect, a defect uh, in a sexual, in a sexual uh, direction. That defect was he wanted to slaughter 
and eat someone. It was an advert on the internet that started it all. Calling himself Frankie, Armin Maiways asked for a well-built man willing to be butchered. He spends hours trawling the internet, looking at um, pornography. Um, and the more that he throws himself into that, the more his urges that he'd repressed for so long are unleashed. The owner of the Cannibal Cafe didn't see anything unusual in Maiways request. No, his posts never stood out. He was never wrote anything alarming because this is what everybody writes. This is so common. You have to actively search for things like cannibalism or eating another human being. It has to be on your mind. That kind of starts to uncover a damaged and dark and broken psyche. I get email from people asking to be snuffed or murdered or cannibalized. And there's thousands and thousands and thousands of people out there. Like I said, I personally have a mailing list of close to 10,000 names. It's been alleged that there are uh, anything up to 300 cannibalistic individuals in Germany trying to find willing or other victims that they can access. Maivez actually turned up around 200 replies. But only one man was prepared to go through with what Maiways wanted. A fellow German from Berlin, Bernd Brandes. Maiways is actually able to find another human being, Brandes, who wants to be consumed, wants to be eaten. Bernd Brandes was an individual who'd been living quite openly as a gay man, and he'd made numerous approaches to other individuals, both via the internet and personally when he'd picked up young men, to ask them if they would take part in a particular ritual where he fantasized about having his own penis bitten off and chewed by another individual. His ex-partner reported how he would beg him to bite his penis. He wanted him to bite his penis off. Brandis was obviously one of those persons who was probably uncomfortable with his own sexuality, but so driven by his own inner demons. On the 9th of March, 2001, Brandes traveled by train to Berlin to meet Maiwes. They went back to Maiwes' family home. Maiwes had already prepared a slaughter room for the purpose of actually finishing off and, and literally dismembering um, the body of Brandes. Maiwes and Brandes get together and they do have sex, but it's not fulfilling enough for Brandes. He wants more, you know, he wants to be hurt and harmed further. In order to go through with it, he has to take sleeping pills and, and drink alcohol. Maui's video is the whole scenario for very good reason. He wants his defence. If he's not going to get away with this, he's going to need to be able to evidence that he had a willing participant in the destruction of Brandes. This was voluntary, and therefore, in his own mind, it was not a crime. Back in the slaughter room, Brandes finally loses patience. The penis is the only real organ that he can afford to lose and see be consumed whilst he is still alive. He actually says to Maiwes, I can't stand it anymore, cut it off. When he placed his um, penis on the table and, and asked for it to be chopped off, initially it, they couldn't do it. So um, Maiwes had to go and get a sharper knife and returned and cut off his, his penis. And Brandes was happy that the blood was uh, this described as spurting out of the wound. For Brandis, having his penis removed without anaesthetic was going to be more excruciatingly painful than he could possibly imagine. And he screamed in agony for, for it's talked about 20 to 30 seconds, he screamed in agony. And then he stopped. And at that point, he expresses disappointment that he thought it would be more painful. Brander's disappointment in not suffering sufficient pain was matched by Maiva's disappointment in eating Brander's penis. Maiva's didn't want to eat the penis. Maiva's wanted to eat rump and thigh and back and heart. He actually tried to eat some of it raw initially, and um, it was too chewy. So Maiva then cooked it in some oil, but apparently it burnt very easy and it was inedible. It, it, they weren't able to eat it, so he actually fed it to his dog. Imagine being Mivas's neighbor for 25 years 
and having shared summer barbecues. I think he's a monster. With his penis cut off, Brander's is bleeding out. And Maiwes, having explored their mutual perversion, takes it further. Maiwes rang Brandes a bath and he went and he was bleeding into the bath. And he, was, he gave him painkillers, um, a bottle of snaps and, and more sleeping pills. He would keep on going back in over the three hour period where he was in the bath. He would kiss him, he would pray whilst he was bleeding to death. And, um, and then eventually at two o'clock in the morning, he, he slit his throat. He was actually still alive, so it wasn't manslaughter, it was actually murder. The prosecution say it's murder, you say it's mercy killing. Uh, the video shows us that the Berliner wanted to die. And my, uh, Mr. Maivis said, OK, I do it. He hung Brandes on a, a meat hook in what was called the slaughter room in his house. You see in the video what he's doing in, in details. He works like a slaughter. It, it looks like the, the man, the victim, is a pig. He took out the organs and he prepared the body, but he also, in that time, was cutting off chunks of his flesh. He dressed his dining room table, he used his best china service, and he took um, a part of Brandes, which, which Maivas actually called the rump steak from his lower back. He cooked some Brussels sprouts and he served some princess potatoes. And he also opened up what he said was a, a very fine red wine, which he allowed to breathe before having it with the meal. He kept Brandes' body in his deep freeze and routinely would go back to cook more and more pieces of his body. And Maivas actually ate around 20 kilos of Brandes' flesh. Maivas said that Brandes tasted like pork, but a very intense kind of pork. Having butchered and eaten Brandes, Maivas goes back online using the name Frankie. It took eight months for the police to arrest Armin Maivas. He was eventually caught after searching for more victims. An Austrian student who also responded to Frankie's search went to the police. Maivis is being held in this prison. He describes eating his victim as like taking Holy Communion. I've seen reporters have to leave the court to be physically sick. The trial became a huge media circus. At the time that Maivis had committed the crime, cannibalism was not actually a legal crime in Germany. Allein durch den Chatverkehr und durch die Gespräche, durch die E-Mails, die die beiden gewechselt haben, ist ganz deutlich zum Ausdruck gekommen, dass dieser Herr aus Berlin hier unbedingt den Herrn Maives, ich drücke es mal mit dem juristischen Wort aus, bestimmt hat zur Tat. Also Calmly striding into court, Armin Maives, the self-confessed cannibal, whose exploits have revolted and intrigued Germany. I hope it'll be okay, was his plight response to journalists. And it was. The judges decided that cutting a man into pieces and eating him didn't amount to murder. Originally, Maivas was charged and found guilty and sentenced for manslaughter, but the prosecution appealed this, and on further inspection of the video they'd both made, it could be shown that Brandes was still alive when Maivas actually stabbed him in the throat. So he then was retried and found guilty of murder. He's not a murderer. He's somebody with an extreme sexual fetish, but to complete that fetish, he needs permission. He's more an extreme sadist sexually, and he needs the permission base of his victim. He needs the perfect masochist. Armin Maiwes is now serving a life sentence for murder. A prison psychiatrist here asked him how he felt about a future behind bars. He replied, I have achieved my life's ambition to eat a man. I'm happy. And what comes next is not important. Mr. Maivis is perhaps not the only cannibal in the world. We have thousands, ten thousands, hundred thousands of people who have the same ideas. Maivis wouldn't have found Brandes but for the internet. The anonymity of the online world provides the perfect space for people like him to explore their warped perversions.
and sometimes act out those sick cravings in the real world. The internet has provided a perfect storm for individuals who have predilections that are dark, that are dangerous to come together and unite. The level of communication is, is often hidden and encrypted, so it's not going to be done on Instagram or easily available on WhatsApp or Twitter. It has created a community of darkness that's quite terrifying and that we don't like to think about, but absolutely exists in every corner of the world.